Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. This is a, a video designed to provide you with examples and applications of the moral theory of utilitarianism to help you sort of wrap your head around how it might be brought into the, the everyday world. Um, it, it, this is very important because Jeremy Bentham thought that the, the moral philosophy that he was putting forth in utilitarianism really did have a lot of traction for our ordinary everyday life. And I, I think in, in large respect he's correct. And if we're talking about product design, this is one of the areas of uh, the economy of life in general where we actually do use the word utilitarian. And it's not always framed in terms of the moral theory as such. We'll see you know, why in just, just a few minutes. But it does have some traction. Um, when we use the term utilitarian, what we're usually thinking about, I think, are these, these three factors over here. A utilitarian design is something that's not particularly attractive, that is, is done you know, for the sake of other, other values, right? Um, helpfulness, um, the way it fits into to, uh, a given system, you know, it, it, it's, in some ways we use the term utilitarian as a substitute for pragmatic. Um, now, if you're thinking about these things in terms of products for human use, in terms of utilitarianism as a moral theory, remember, what does it utilitarianism say? What we want to do is we want to maximize human pleasure or happiness and minimize human pain or unhappiness. And utilitarianism looks at everybody concerned, so it doesn't just look at you the way you know, an egoistic perspective on that would do. It is, it is uh, much more widespread. It's saying everybody's pleasure and pain counts. So, you know, think about, for example, lighting off firecrackers on your, on your neighbor's step. It could be quite fun. This is the sort of thing we did as kids when I was a kid. And um, we got a real kick out of it. We got a lot of pleasure out of it. The more firecrackers we had to light off, you know, for us, the better it was. But there's, you know, other people concerned. You know, the neighbor has to clean up their step. Sometimes it's not just a matter of sweeping up uh, fragments of paper, but, you know, actual like burn marks and things like that that are hard to get out uh, might scare them which produces a kind of unhappiness um, it, it you know it could be seen to have some longer lasting effects you know screw up friendships um, if it, you know if they find out who it is they got to call your parents and then you know your parents have some hassles as well so you can see that actions sometimes have these wider nets of consequences and they may bring pleasure for some people and maximize pleasure for some people, but um, create pain for other people. So utilitarian would want to take account of that. And when it comes to designing products or producing products or selling products or marketing products, all these sorts of things that we, we do with them, a utilitarian would want to be conscious of those elements as well. Uh, well. We'll talk about some of these issues about marketing and things like that when I do a video specifically on, on business applications of utilitarianism. So let's come back to this. Um, why are these important factors? Cost, reliability, durability. Well, you know, if you can produce 10 times the amount of units um, a given thing. Let's, let's say we take a luxury item like um, cologne and perfume, right? Or let's expand this to any sort of cosmetic products. Cosmetic products, there's, at least for the, the more expensive things, there's a lot of money spent on advertising, there's a lot of money spent on promotion in other respects. There are 
higher quality ingredients in the more expensive things, but they're not such higher quality necessarily that it would make sense from a utilitarian perspective to actually have them or produce them. Um, cost is a factor. Why is cost a factor? Because every time you're paying for something, you're absorbing a little bit of pain. Uh, now, you, know, you can defer the pain by putting it on a credit card or something like that. Uh, but in general, you know, we, we can measure things in terms of how much would you be willing to pay for it. How much other pleasures are you willing to forego for it? How much hurt to your you know, wallet or pocketbook or something like that are you willing to sustain for it? How much are you willing to trade off for it? So if you can bring the cost down, if you can produce a lot more product for people at a lower cost, that would be a good thing from a utilitarian perspective. Now, you know, when you lower cost, that generally means um, losing some other dimensions or elements of the thing. We'll talk about that in a moment. Let's think about reliability as well. There's really nothing that makes a product lose its value like unreliability. You know, when I get a phone, I want that phone to do what it is that it's supposed to do without a lot of glitches, you know, I want the, the software updates to, you know, upgrade very quickly and not, you know, to screw things up, not lose my contacts, for example. I want, when I make a phone call, we see, you know, all sorts of advertisements about this. I want to actually be able to get the other person on the other end. When I do my email on here, I want to know that the email is actually going out or that I'm getting the email. Um, you know, a coffee cup design. Um, you don't have to do an awful lot with a coffee cup. This is a very utilitarian coffee cup, but it's got to pour out right. You know, if, if it spills too easily, that would be unreliable design. Um, we can think of this in terms of all sorts of other things, you know. I, I have some lists of, of products, product ranges that we would often think about. Uh, let's think about clothing, for example. Reliability in terms of clothing might be, you know, if it's billed as being waterproof, it actually does keep the water off. Um, you don't want to find that sort of thing out when you're actually put to the test. Um, cars or transportation, this is a big issue, right? You don't want to have your car breaking down all the time and need repairs. That also fits in with cost as well. Um, living spaces, you know, you don't want the roof to leak. You want the uh, plumbing fixtures to work as they are supposed to. You want um, the air conditioning or the heating to, to work as um, food or cooking, you know, if you, this is why some people go to, go to chain restaurants because they, they have the sense that there's a kind of reliability to them, they know what they're going to get, and that's not actually true necessarily, it really depends on who's, who's serving it, who's managing and stuff like that, but there's a, there's a perception of that. So reliability is a plus for, for products, right? If you can make a product more reliable, from a utilitarian perspective, you're cutting out a lot of, uh, you're not necessarily giving pleasure, you're actually cutting out pain or unhappiness that people feel when the product fails for them. Durability, this is closely related. How long is your product going to last? Um, I'll give you an example from my, my own life. Um, we had some rakes. I've done a lot of raking of leaves and, and things like that in, in my life. I've always lived um, you know, near or in the countryside, uh, with a few exceptions. And so I always had a yard that I had to take care of. Um, either it was my parents' yard or somebody else's yard. Or, you know. Anyway, um, we had rakes that were built really well, and my grandfather had bought them. And I used those rakes for at least 25 years of my, my life until they finally started, you know, breaking down. And when they broke down, it was only like individual bits on the, you know, teeth, I guess you'd call them, on the rake that were breaking off. And eventually it got to the point where I said, ah, I'm gonna go, go and get some, some new rakes. Well, most of the stuff that you can buy out there in the store is actually, you know, frankly speaking, crap. Um, it's not built to last anymore. And so I would start raking and you know these plastic rakes that you can buy very cheaply anywhere you go, and the the rod itself, the the handle, it would snap. You know, I'm a big guy, so I put a lot of force into it, right? 
and a stamp on me. Well, that's not a useful product. That's actually you know, either cutting out pleasure. I actually enjoy raking leaves. But I only enjoy raking leaves when it actually goes right. Um, the product design could have minimized pain or unhappiness. And you, you know, notice these can all tie in together. If you make things so cheaply, and you offer just a lot of them on the market like we do in all these you know, big, big box stores, but the product is basically just cheap crap that um, people are mass producing and are really not designed for sustained use, then um, probably it's not a good idea from a utilitarian perspective. There are certain break points, you might say, where you know, emphasizing cost you know, and avoiding the, the, the um, unhappiness that comes with paying more money is actually cutting into these other values. So you have to think about that if you're, if you're designing products from a utilitarian perspective. Um, cost is a factor, um, but these other things are important too. Now, very often people think of utilitarianism as, as you know, in terms of products as just that. You know, so you're gonna go get a coffin. Um, you know, here's a famous example: you can pay a lot of money for coffins, um, or you can get yourself a pine box. And they don't want to show you pine boxes because pine boxes are very cheap. And as far as like, you know, keeping a dead body in, in the, the grave, eh, you know, they're all about the same reliability, aren't they? I mean, it's not going anywhere, is it? Um, so, you know, durability is not really a big issue either. So, you know, just go with the cheapest thing you could possibly find. That would be good utilitarian thinking right there. Um, but are there other factors? You know, we can think about this as well for, you know, coffee. Buy coffee in, in bulk. Um, don't get the fancy stuff that, that requires a lot of marketing. Just, you know, buy coffee that tastes good to you and, and you're, you're fine. You know, you're, you're getting a reliable experience. Um, buy a ton of it so you've got a lot, of, a lot of it on hand. You freeze it and you can buy it fairly cheaply. We could go on and on and on with examples like that, you know. Um, but is that all there is to it? You know, does utilitarianism mean giving up on beauty, on design, on form, on what we would call aesthetics? Well, only a short-sighted kind of utilitarianism would do that. Because, again, utilitarianism is about pleasure, isn't it? So it's not just cutting out people's pain or providing them with tools that help them to get the job done. You also want things to look nice, like I put here. You know, design has to do with the look of things. Now, this is not an attractive coffee mug. It wasn't even attractive when the uh, lettering was there. I paid like a, you know, a couple bucks for it, and it entitled me to, to buy coffee more cheaply. That's why I bought it. Um, my otter box that I have, this is designed for durability. This is not designed for looks. There are some, you know, phone covers that are a lot more uh, pretty and, um, you know, might feel better in the hand. But this thing, this is designed to take a beating. And I've, I've actually, unfortunately, put it through the ringer. But this is what my, my military students used to like back when I taught at, at Fayetteville State University. And for good reason, because this is close to, close to, not completely, but close to unbreakable. Um, so for somebody like me who's kind of a klutz, it's, it's very handy to have. But it doesn't look very nice, does it? If you could design a product that actually have these features over here, but also look nice from a utilitarian perspective, that would be the right thing to do. The feel of things is also very important, particularly when we get to, say, tools, you know, or transportation, or clothing. You know, you can make very cheap clothing that doesn't fit well, um, and it doesn't feel as good. It's not only it doesn't look as good, it doesn't feel as good for the person who's, who's wearing it. Cars and transportation, I have a very difficult time finding cars that, that um, are good for me, in part because I'm six foot three and have a long torso, so I sit up pretty high. It's hard to get good visibility. Um, it's also hard to get leg room in, in today's cars. Um, not so hard in, in, in earlier cars, interestingly enough, but, but it is hard in today's cars, which tend to be designed, I think, for people who are on average about five foot eight, maybe, if that. Um, 
So the feel of things is important. Living spaces, the feel of living spaces is incredibly important. Not only the look, but how, how people flow in them, how, how it feels to you going into them. And these things can be difficult to quantify, but there are ways around this. Tools should be designed so that they actually fit the hand well. Um, sometimes you pay a bit more for a tool that actually you know, fits your body well. And it, it, makes us, it makes good sense from a utilitarian perspective because it gives you pleasure to have that kind of tool. Um, I, I do a lot of, or I have done a lot of outdoors work, and I can tell you that the difference between a cheap shovel and a shovel that's well designed is incredible. Uh, a chainsaw. Chainsaws can be put together in you know, shoddy ways that just you know, get the job done more or less, provided you don't run them too much. And if you actually are a professional, you got to buy one of the high-end chainsaws because it's got to have the durability. But if it fits your, your body well, it becomes a joy to use. And that's about, that's about maximizing pleasure for people, isn't it? Um, the sound of things. We might even go on to say, you know, talk about the other senses. You know, smell, taste, all those sorts of things. And the performance itself. How does it perform? How does it interface with you? So from a utilitarian perspective, uh, beauty does matter, you know? If, um, if you know, getting a, a phone case that actually had, let's say you loved some, some let's say you were in love with the, the painting the screen, and it had Edward Munch's The Scream on the back, right? So you can look at the screen every half an hour or so when you take out your phone, if you're kind of a, you know, big phone user, and it gives you a little bit of pleasure each time, from a utilitarian perspective, that would be a good product. Right? Um, now, of course, if it terrified you every time you took it out, that would probably be a bad product, wouldn't it? Um, is that all there is? Is that all we have to think about? Um, no. And, and this really has to do with the, this part of the greatest happiness principle. You need to minimize pain or unhappiness. So you have to ask, when it comes to products, product design about what we call the supply chain. This is what Apple got in a lot of trouble for lately, but other companies do as well. Are you, in order to produce these kinds of things, and in order to produce them with these kinds of values, and particularly in terms of this one, right? Are you outsourcing human misery? Are you inflicting pain, unhappiness, in a variety of different forms? Deprivation, poverty, uh, unsafe working conditions that can lead to accidents, that can lead to abuses, all sorts of things that people don't, not only don't enjoy, but find degrading or humiliating. Are you building that into the product? Remember, from a utilitarian perspective, everybody's pleasures and pains count. So if your product is being designed, being produced, being uh, uh, sent out, you might say, you know, being traded here and there, and it's a product that by the way it's designed is going to require a lot of other people's very low paid, uh, dangerous sometimes, sometimes painful labor to go into it, that has to be factored in as, as part of the equation. So if you had two different products and one of them was slightly cheaper than the other, but it had a much higher cost in human misery, that should actually be a much higher cost overall, in not just a dollar amount. Um, and you probably should not prefer that product. You, if you're a good utilitarian, you would, you would probably be concerned about where your product is, is coming from. Um, you would probably also want to know about possible misuse. You would want to think about that. Uh, if you could design a product so it could be less easily misused by people to cause other people pain or unhappiness, you would want to do that from a utilitarian perspective. Um, 
So I mean, you can think about all of these. There's lots of other examples you could, you could come up with. But think about all of these and how they how they play out. Um, even down to websites and, and apps. You know, you want a website or app to be reliable. You want it to look a certain way. Uh, so supply chain, unless you you have a bunch of programmers, you know, chained to desks. I don't think that would probably be a, be a real issue. Possible misuse could be could be a real issue when you're designing uh, some sort of website or yeah, you know, if you're designing um, a philosophy website, probably you know the biggest misuse that you might get out of it would be students cutting corners, using your information and incorporating it into papers. And uh, you know that's not a good thing, but that's kind of a fairly small thing from a, from a utilitarian perspective. But um, what if you were designing a website that allowed people to look up, you know, former classmates, but you were kind of, kind of uh, weak in the security protocols you're building into it, the vetting of the people? And some people were using this to look up their spouses who they who, who had left them uh, because they had abused them, and now they wanted to track down their, their spouse and abuse them more. While that would be uh, possible misuse, and if you had two different websites one of which allows that sort of thing, one of which doesn't allow that. From a utilitarian perspective, the one that allows it is a much worse you know, proposition than the one that doesn't allow that. So there's a lot of different factors that go into just thinking about products. We're not even yet at the, the level of human decisions and choices and all that sort of stuff, other than you know, how should we design products that we, we surround ourselves with, external goods in the, the you know, traditional classification of goods. Um, that's probably uh, enough about that. The, the only thing, other thing I want to talk about is, is maybe say food. You know, um, would it make sense from a utilitarian perspective to pay a little bit more for food that is well plated? You know, tastes better, looks better, is is offered to you in a congenial atmosphere. That's probably an issue. This is an issue for food. This is a big issue for food. Who is actually involved in the production of your food? Or uh, even you know, just the gathering. Who's picking your, your vegetables and fruits? Who's, who's killing the, the meat that you're eating? Um, how is it getting there? How much resources are being consumed to get that from California or from Chile? or wherever they're getting the stuff from to, to your, your table. If you were a utilitarian, you would probably be concerned about that. So I think if you were a utilitarian, you know, you probably would be concerned with things like sustainability um, and fair labor practices and things along those lines. Um, so we'll leave you off with that. And I'm going to shoot a number of these other videos talking about uh, other examples.